Four experts with decades of experience observing European politics and economics gathered for a debate in Brussels, base of the European Union. Professor Patrick Minford of Cardiff Business School, Cardiff University, served as an advisor to the Treasury of former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. He is a firm believer in the notion that the UK could prosper outside the EU. British people feel, well, this wasn't quite what we wanted. We don't want to be ruled by this super state. German national Fabian Zulig is chief economist of Belgium-based think tank, the European Policy Center. He stresses the importance of unity for Europe's continued development and points out the flaws in the argument of the Leave campaign. When I look at where we are uh, globally, where we are with the kind of challenges which the EU faces, both internal challenges and external challenges, I cannot believe that fragmentation and isolation can be the right answer to that. Philip Gordon is a senior fellow at the US Council on Foreign Relations and previously served as a special assistant to President Barack Obama. He gives the US perspective on Brexit and the possible political disarray in Europe. The last thing America needs from Europe is disintegration. We need a, a, a partner and, and actually a transatlantic community. Dominic Moisy is a senior advisor at the French Institute of International Relations. He contends that the importance of Europe cannot be adequately expressed simply in economic terms. The European Union is much, much more than trade. It is a community of value. It is a model of reconciliation. Moderator Kaudi Nagao is chief of NHK's Brussels Bureau and has been following the economy and politics of Europe for many years. So this evening we are delighted to, to tackle this uh, one of the hottest topic in Europe um, these days is Brexit. So on 23rd of Ju June we're going to have uh, observed the decision by the British people that uh, whether they're going to stay or leave the EU. So um, depending on the outcome, the EU may lose uh, for the first time in its history the, one of its members. So we're going to tackle this issue with uh, all these various opinions from experts like you, four panellists, and uh, I want to have a very intensive discussion on this topic. Professor Minford, what, why the many British people are standing against uh, Brussels and why do you think Britain should leave the EU? British people feel that they don't really have any say in how they're governed anymore. Because mm. majority, as Monsieur Delors said in, in a speech to the Trade Union Congress in 1988, he said in uh, five or ten years, 80% of the laws for the UK were made in Brussels. Brit British people feel, well, this wasn't quite what we wanted. We don't want to be ruled by this super state. And also, uh, our economic philosophy is more free market perhaps, and also, uh, you know, the trade. There are problems about trade and regulation, which mm -hmm. I could talk about, but I think that's enough for now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Zulik, uh, would you think, like, the um, EU is too undemocratic? Well, I think there, there are quite a few things I would disagree with in, in that analysis, both historically and where the EU is at the moment. Um, in the end, uh, the European Union has been created by democratic governments working together, uh, none of the decisions which have been made have been imposed on any of the governments which are taking part. So I think what we have in the end uh, is a structure uh, which has worked remarkably well uh, in producing a lot of positive outcomes, uh, both on the economic front but also on the political front. Uh, there are problems, of course there are problems, but I think particularly in the current circumstances, uh, where we have challenges which are clearly across borders. They are not challenges which can be dealt with at the national level. We need institutions which can deal with this, and the European Union is the best we have. Mm -hmm. Professor Minford, um, you have also said about the, your economist, and you also said about the um, uh, Britain can go out from the, the single market, and then you can achieve, the Britain can achieve, without EU, you can achieve a, a much more um, stronger position in terms of national income and living standards. Um, what's your argument? On what ground? Well, I kind of explained that the EU is protectionist. It has high levels of protection around it, which is part of the kind of project. And. Uh, you know, it's kind of basic in economics that if you go to free trade, you're better off. Mm -hmm. That's fundamentally the position that uh, I take. And um, 
So if we leave the EU, we'll become a free trading nation. We, we, we won't impose tariffs on anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll simply trade freely, which is the best thing for a small, you know, a small trading nation to do. We're, we're quite a big trading nation, but we're still small relative to the world. So we will become you know, a free trading uh, nation and we'll, we'll set our own regulations. So I think that, uh, you know, that, that it's essentially that economics is at the core of this discussion. And uh, the British people are kind of like, like the Greeks, you know, who were, who, were, who were afraid to leave the euro because they were told it would cause chaos. All these economists, you see, in the governmental institutions, all the establishment is ganging up on the British people to tell them it'll be chaos if they leave Europe. And that's the main argument they're using. Uh, this is a lie, in my opinion, but explaining to people just why it's a lie when they're not really economically literate is, is quite a problem. Mm -hmm. What would you think, uh, Mrs. Dr. Zlig, about this assessment of that economically Britain will be well off without the EU? Or would you think it's much more having more negative impact if the, the remain, uh, Brexit uh, happens? Well, I, I think um, there are big differences of opinion. Um, my opinion is not the same. I wouldn't say it's a lie. I think there are very good reasons to believe uh, that an exit would be costly, um, certainly that it would be costly in the short term. There's a transition period uh, which would come with a huge amount of uncertainty uh, and uncertainty in any economic model is costly. Uh, uncertainty leads to a loss of investment, it leads to uh, a loss of long-term perspective uh, for the international system. I would also say that uh, even if I believe that Britain would be a free trading nation and we would have to see what the political decisions are in uh, a UK outside uh, the EU, but even if that was the case, it might be the case that Britain doesn't impose tariffs, but how would Britain stop others from imposing tariffs on them? And the international trading system now is governed by a lot of bilateral treaties, which are all done by the EU at the moment. So the UK would have to renegotiate these treaties and I would question whether the UK would be in a very good position to renegotiate those treaties. The EU is a very protectionist bloc and it's a very large group. So uh, some countries feel it's advantageous to, to get into it. The problem for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's our most significant trade agreement, is the one with the EU. The problem is that it's damaging to us. I can imagine some countries which are benefited by it, for example Germany I think is benefited by it, because it sells a lot to everybody else, but we don't sell much to, to, to the rest of the EU, so the, the arguments for a customs union for us are very weak, and this is, this is why exactly the, the trade agreement plays the other way. I find that a bit surprising because uh, the US, for example, is negotiating trade re agreements not just with the EU but with countries all around the world. Yes, I think want... every, single, uh, every single country around the world is negotiating tra yeah. trade re agreements. So the UK would be the only country in the world which wouldn't need this. I find that very strange. Yeah. And by the end of the day, if I may say, uh, the debate is not going to be decided on trade. And it's not even an issue of sovereignty but it is an issue of identity. Do you feel European or not? And I would accept that probably because of their geography and their history, British, probably English, much more so than Scottish, do not feel they belong to Europe. Uh, but by the end of the day, and this is my position, uh, it would be a lose-lose proposition if you were to leave, because you are not strong enough to do without us, and we are not strong enough to do without you. And the European Union is much, much more than trade. It is a community of value. It is a model of reconciliation, which is much admired in part of the world like Asia and Japan in particular. And why would you impose on Europe such a cost precisely at a time when geopolitics is become much harsher. You want to make Vladimir Putin smile a lot at this particular moment. I don't think it's reasonable. We are discussing the possibility of Europe to continue to play a significant role in the world. And you are preventing Europe to play that role precisely at a time when it's much more dangerous outside. You know, think, you, you talked about Asia, okay? Now I'm going to talk about Japan. Japan would never enter into a political union with anyone else in Asia, you know? Because it's a very, 
independent country. It wants to be self-governed. Uh, and, and that's the same. We're kind of similar, actually. Britain and uh, Japan are quite similar, similar island nations. And they, they really don't like the idea of being ruled by other people. So you're right about that. And you see, uh, Japan, however, is, is in an awful, a huge nexus of alliances. And so are we. We will move out of the role we're in, where we're being kind of dominated by a sort of Franco-German Italian consensus, you see, which you love, of course, and, and so, does, uh, uh, so does Dr. Zulik, uh, because you're, you know, you're part of that consensus. But we'll still talk to you guys. We still love you. It's just that we don't want to be ruled by you, you know? And we want to have our own free market arrangements. There is a social democratic consensus on the continent, which is shared very widely about how you organize society, you know? You do, it's kind of social, socialist a little bit. It, it's not about owning the means of production, but it's about regulating them. How, how, how people behave. So that, this is it. I don't think you should bring this policy into it, this policy, foreign policy stuff, because we're still going to love you. We're still going to talk to you. We're still allies. Yes, yes. Dominique, yes. I've enjoyed listening to my European colleagues debate it, which is entirely appropriate, because at the end of the day, it's more for you than for us. But I think Americans have a stake in this outcome very much uh, as well. On the point of what this will lead to or what impact it will have in Europe or beyond, I think the main thing to say is we don't know. Uh, and, and Patrick talked about, you know, scaremongering in Britain and raising the specter of what could happen. And it's fair to warn people about this scaremongering, but it's also fair to say, we don't know, we haven't seen anything like this before. Maybe uh, those on the continent won't be so eager to find a new trading arrangement with Britain. Maybe investors, as was already said as well, will have a question, is Britain where I really want to invest? There's an American element of that. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg was just uh, talking about this issue. He's setting up uh, uh, an outpost of his business in the UK. And he was honest. And he said, if Britain leaves uh, the European Union, we'll have to think about where we want to have our headquarters in Europe. Uh, so I don't think you can be so sure that you know, everything will be fine and we just renegotiate these things. I have real questions about what relationship, what trading and investment relationship Britain will have with the rest of the EU if it leaves. Dr. Gordon, would you think that there will be a change of the diplomacy and also security policies from the U.S. when they look at the, you look at the, uh, the Europeans with this turbulent situation? Uh, I think we worry about the impact on that as well. Again, you know, not to overstate anything, if Britain leaves the European Union, which it's its right to do if it's what it wants to do, we will still have very close relationship with our you know, closest long-standing partner mm -hmm. and with the European Union. But that's not to say that we wouldn't worry about the consequences. The President of the United States addressed this directly yeah himself uh, in London recently, and he made clear that when we think about this, we have an interest in a strong, united European partner. You know, when we look around the world for allies and people who think like we do, can contribute and help us in the Middle East on climate change and terrorism, Europeans are often, you know, at the top of that list. No, yeah, Philip yeah, is right. a deafening roar from Washington along these lines. Um, more or less like implying that we have no right to leave because Washington doesn't agree, which no, is not ever exactly... Nobody you don't have a right to leave. <laughs> well, uh, it's kind of a bit like that. And all I'm saying to you is, politically, as one of our oldest allies, you know, you've got to respect the decisions of an ally about how they want to be governed. It's a very basic decision. And, uh, of course, it's in your interest to do it because we are an important ally in various respects. Uh, we're not a huge power or anything like that, but we're quite important economically, you know, in various ways. And also, you know, um, it's in the interest of Europe for us to be in a friendly, allied relationship with all these other European countries. You are, at the same time, overestimating the cards of Great Britain alone and underestimating the potential cost for Great Britain and for Europe of a leave vote. It's your right. You are totally entitled to do so. But even if I agree uh, with Philip, we don't know what will happen. What I know is that the moment there is a leave vote, the image of Europe in the world will be different. The symbolic impact will be immediate. And your comparison with Japan, the two islands, I find it culturally, historically strange. Because to a large extent, Japanese don't really feel Asians the way Europeans feel Europeans. Because of history, your history has been so linked to us. We love you within 
with whatever differences you You're have. You're forgetting quite a lot of history, actually, Dominique. You know, Henry VIII, the dissolution of the monasteries. Well, I mean, there's a huge history of British yeah, separatism. It's part of, and, it's and part of, of your it's part of European well, history. It's part of European history. One of the things about... Constantly we have been separate, because we, we're but, an island. But the nostalgia for the good old days when European nations were separate, by the way, uh, that separateness led to a couple of world wars that yes. didn't serve anybody particularly well, yeah, not, which was I'm one not, of the reasons. No, but there is, there is, this, the, it's, it's, it's relevant. You guys that want to keep Europe together at all costs, you know, because of, uh, that are nostalgic. I mean, we're kind of being just pragmatic here, you see. It's about government. It's actually about, it's about brass tacks. It's about how Europe governs us, fundamentally, and where Europe is going. Europe at the moment is going, uh, as, as uh, you know, um, has been pointed out uh, by Fabian, it's going towards a very concerted effort at Union in order to deal with the disasters of the Euro. <laughs> and don't pretend Europe has been successful. Europe has been economically one of the most unsuccessful groups of nations for the last 20 years that you could find in the world economy. It's been a disaster area. And in the last five, it has wrecked several southern European economies through this Euro project. And so I understand you, all guy, you guys want to have union and a state and a common taxes, you were saying earlier, and all this sort of thing. Uh, this will make things really difficult for us because we never voted for that. <laughs> I've never seen in history such a failing union that has attracted so many people on its soil. Public discontent is on the rise across Europe, fueled by worsening unemployment, a sudden surge in refugees and economic migrants, and a succession of high-profile terrorist attacks. In France, promises to address such concerns have given great momentum to the right-wing National Front political party. De l'Union européenne visant à répartir entre 500 et 700 000 migrants dans les pays de l'Union européenne. Pour nous, c'est non. By blaming EU immigration policy for the loss of jobs, the right-wing parties are creating a tide of anti-EU sentiment. Ils ne veulent plus être dirigés du dehors, se soumettre à des lois qu'ils n'ont pas votées. Not only in France, but in countries such as Britain and Denmark, parties opposed to the EU have managed to acquire seats in the European Parliament. The EU was founded on the idea of a united Europe, but what we see now is a community that is increasingly divided. What we see from the Brexit uh, UK referendum, we see clear divisions. Um, I want to go to the, the movement or the rise of populism within Europe. This is the, one of the big issues nowadays in, uh, in Europe. And, um, Professor Moise, you have been having a lot of articles and uh, writes a lot about this uh, concerns about the rise of populism. And would you see that the, one of the examples, like uh, this UK referendum, do you see the, the danger or the risk of rising nationalist populism? Yes, but you have to understand the roots yes. of the rise of populism. Uh, there is an anti-elite feeling that is absolutely clear, uh, I would say from Europe, to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the same boat from that standpoint. Uh, a sense of growing inequality uh, between those who have and those who have not. It exists in Europe. I think it exists in the United States. Uh, you've seen in the United States uh, relatively strong growth, uh, relatively low unemployment, but 80% of the Americans are actually poorer today than they were in 2007. They have not yet come back to where they were. And in Europe, it's worse uh, in global terms. Uh, beyond the rejection of elites, beyond the personal feeling of having lost uh, in the process of time, you have also uh, the rejection of politics and politicians, which is part of the crisis of the elite, but which is very strong. Mm. And uh, you see uh, the rise of uh, strong men, uh, big voice, uh, from uh, Donald Trump in the United States to uh, Marine Le Pen 
strong men uh, in, uh, in, in France, uh, including uh, Mr. Farage in uh, the uh, United Kingdom, and now Boris Johnson aligning himself on that uh, category uh, of people. And of course, all of these plays against Europe because in the members of the European Union, uh, this is used uh, by those uh, who are rejecting uh, the system. And I would say that what made the difference in the last few months, years, has been, of course, a culture of fear accelerated by the coming of refugees. But the coming of refugees is the last element. It does not create fear. It plays on fear mm -hmm. that already existed. Mm -hmm. And this is where populism is uh, leading us. We used to be a model of democracy for the world, mm -hmm. and uh, we unfortunately are playing dangerously uh, with those ideas. What will uh, Austria being clearly a case in point? Mm. Would that actually stop the, the movement for ever closer union principle or the further integration of Europe then? Well, initially, I used to say that uh, there were four potential divorces within Europe, mm -hmm. uh, between Northern Europe succeeding and uh, Southern Europe failing economically, between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, the second uh, being lighter on fundamental democratic values. There is a divorce of situation which I describe between my country France and Germany, the feeling that we no longer play in the same league and there is a potential forced divorce. And we all know about it on June 24th, and that is between Great Britain and the European Union. But the rise of populism all over Europe is, of course, a force encouraging those various divorce and this process of fragmentation. Let's be a little careful. Because what you're doing is you're saying anybody that disagrees with the elite in Europe is a populist. No. And this is, this, is the, this is what we've got in the UK. The Financial Times and The Economist, which are great pro-EU organs, they constantly refer to Brexit as a populist movement. Now, of course, there is an element of, of what you're talking about in the Brexit group. I mean, there are people who are very concerned about immigration and have been neglected by the elite. You know, the elite like to have cheap foreign labor, the, 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 the people who don't like it are the people where they settle, uh, you know, whose jobs they take and whose hospital beds they take and whose education they take. Of course, the elite says, oh, it's populist to worry about these people. And so they get upset, as you rightly said. They get upset because they feel they're not getting fairly treated. And it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate view of people, you know. If you neglect people and you don't compensate them, they're going, to, they're going to object. It's part of the democratic process, actually. And it's very, it's very convenient for the European elite, of which you're a very distinguished member, Dominique, to say, oh, it's all very populist, you know, a barely populist. But it's a bit, it's a, you've got to be a bit careful. There is a huge amount of belief of what the European Union does. Uh, I think even in terms of the wording, if I hear things like, the elite is ruling Europe. This is entirely nonsense. This is not how the European Union works. Uh, this is a system where democratic states have come together and have agreed common laws. These have been agreed by all the countries involved. This is not some kind of super state which is imposing things. I do not believe that at the moment we are moving closer to an ever closer union. I think we should be, but that is not the, 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 the trajectory we are on at the moment, in part because of all this fragmentation we have within, uh, within in the European Union. Um, but this is part of a democratic process where we are discussing things at the European level and I would not follow this caricature of some kind of super state which is trying to dominate the lives of, of people in Europe. Uh, this has never been the purpose of the European Union and I don't see anyone who buys into that at the moment. Mm. And Dr. Gordon, yes, I want to know about the situation in the United States, about with this uh, quite um, popularity, huge popularities of uh, Mr. Donald Trump. Do you see the similarities then? There are absolutely similarities. Let me, let me say two things. First on the origins of the populism and then Trump and what's happening in the US. They're related. I just wanted to say, I, I think Patrick makes an entirely legitimate point about the costs and consequences 
of openness and globalization. At the same time, critics of globalization and openness should acknowledge that it has vastly made their countries more prosperous. And the reflexive notion that you sometimes hear in the sort of populist circles, or you will, or anti-EU, or whatever you want to call it, that you know, immigrants are taking jobs and trade are you know, repressing wages, overlooks that uh, in almost all of those cases, they also make the country vastly richer. Immigrants are coming. They are actually doing jobs. They are producing things and keeping prices of things uh, lower, prices that would be much higher for many of the very people that are complaining. They're paying taxes because they're coming as workers and contributing. So it's a legitimate debate. It's a legitimate debate for economists, but it is, I think, dangerous to want to shut all of that out. I mean, we talk about nostalgia and go back to some alleged glory days when you, know, you didn't have to deal with cheap imports or immigrants when also your country was notably poorer. I think a lot of Americans thought that this trend was happening in Europe, but not, we were not so susceptible to it. And in our election this year, we're realizing that a lot of Americans feel the same way. Mm -hmm. This resentment of many of the same things, trade, immigration. Um, in the US, it plays out. Uh, there is a lot of populist anger at Mexicans for allegedly stealing jobs. People see immigration and they say they're taking the jobs that we would have. There's a lot of resentment and anger at China on trade and Japan. You hear Trump talk about how all these countries are, have, you know, uh, we have trade deficits with them. But it's a dangerous trend to somehow suggest that the solution to these problems is to cut off trade, cut off immigration, and seal ourselves off from the world. Okay. Now, in this particular case, I think it's a real improvement in policy if you take account of the interests of poor people who are, the, who are kind of competing with the immigrants, you know? And, and actually, it's not entirely crazy to suggest that we should have a, a system of immigration control a bit like the US. I mean, you guys have it. Why shouldn't we? Why have we got to let in anybody from the EU who's unskilled without any let or hindrance when they really upset a large segment of our opinion. And so, they don't give us much, rather, they don't give us any so economic you want to gain either. the million Brits who are working and prospering by working in the European Union, but just shut out the Europeans no, who no, would no, go no, work no, in Britain. No, 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 when, when, no one's talking about shutting anybody out, you see. What, what people are talking about, having a sane immigration system, like you have. Now, if I were to say to the Americans, you just, you we know, by the way, just open more up your borders, you know, to anybody who's Patrick, on your neighbor. We accept vastly more immigrants into our economy uh, legally uh, we, we accept an awful lot, by the way, right, in the UK. Listen, an lo awful lot. And there's no one's talking about and cutting it off. They're talking about rebalancing it and in terms of a green card system. So don't let's talk about this as being a terrible, frightful sort of populist uprising by people who are completely unreasonable. It's a perfectly reasonable demand by any country that there be some control of the of the immigration and that it be balanced towards skill shortages and such like. I mean, Australia does it, New Zealand does it, the US does it. The list is endless. Professor Moisey, can I just go back to the, like, um, in case of this more like nationalist movement, do you think there will be a revival of nation state and more conservatism in Europe? Well, but nationalism can take two different roads. There is the nationalism of those who want to build bridges, and there is the nationalism of those who want to erect walls. Mm -hmm. And these are two trends of nationalism. Personally, I prefer the nationalism that goes into the way of bridges because this is a nationalism that takes into consideration the lessons of the past and what happened as a result of uh, harsh competition and uh, diffidence mm -hmm. between each other. But because I want my country, France, to be stronger, I can only think of my country as a member of the European Union, because I know personally that alone I represent very little. And I remember uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel in her last campaign turning to German public opinion saying, we may be the biggest country in Europe demographically and economically, but we represent only 1% of world population. Mm -hmm. We are nothing alone. And that was the saying of the largest, biggest, strongest European country. Mm -hmm. How about in Germany? Uh, we talk about um, possible exit of UK, relative decline of power of France. 
and then we have Germany. Would you think like a Germany would become too powerful? Well, I think the, the question of what is too powerful is, is quite difficult to, to answer. I think for Germany it has always been very important uh, to have uh, cooperation with other countries. Um, historically, since the Second World War, France has always been uh, the, the most important partner in this, um, but also the cooperation with Britain has been very important. There are a lot of shared interests between Britain and, and Germany. So certainly for Germany, uh, I think um, being in this position of, uh, if you like, accidental strength is um, not a good situation if it's based on the weakness of some of the partners. No, and, the, the, if I may, just one moment. Uh, the problem is not that Germany is too strong. Mm -hmm. The problem is that France has become too weak. The problem is that France, in the last 20 years, has not had a president that was the equivalent of a German chancellor. Mm -hmm. And we have to remedy that. Who would you think that the leadership will be taken in your EU? Well, I think that, that is one of the problems we have at the moment, that mm -hmm. um, leadership uh, cannot be exercised by an individual countries. I think this is one of the great things about the European Union. That was always the case. Uh, the European Union was designed so that no single country, and especially not Germany, could dominate the mm -hmm. system. Um, but if we now have certain weaknesses in a number of countries, mm -hmm. it then leads to an absence of leadership. And I think that is the big problem we have at the moment. So it's not the dominance of Germany, but it's the absence of a collective leadership which can take the the European Union in a positive direction mm -hmm. to deal with these cross-border challenges, mm -hmm. which we shouldn't forget, because in the end, that is what the European Union is about. It's about the kind of challenges we're facing at the moment, which we cannot solve on a national basis, mm -hmm. where we clearly have a need to work together to cooperate. Can I just say that I think that Europe's problems are entirely self-inflicted. You know, you've, you've, you took this aggressive view towards the euro, you're now taking an aggressive view towards centralization to save the euro. You know, you took a very aggressive view towards climate change, which raised the costs of energy hugely, you know. Many would argue quite unnecessarily because, you know, you could, there are alternative ways to tackle these things. And, of course, then on the whole refugee and immigration thing, you went boldly towards Schengen without thinking about how you're going to police the borders of the EU. You created this great, you know, hugely mobile area in, in, in the EU without any thought for how you police the borders. And this was, this was all, these are all examples of kind of group think at the EU level. I think firstly, um, one thing which is a, a clear misrepresentation of the situation is this you and we. It is not you who's done anything, it is we. The UK was a member state throughout that whole period and carried all the decisions all the decisions which were taken, every treaty had to be unanimous. This is not uh, uh, something which the UK... But you know, probably we opted out of the euro because we totally disagreed yes. with it. We and argued that was, strongly against it. That was it. the choice, so I don't see how the, the UK was we said that not it would be involved bad for in Europe, the decision. And it was I, think the, to be. I think the second point, uh, which I, I absolutely don't recognize, is this idea that uh, the European Union is on a path somewhere um, where it has imposed something on all the member states, where uh, it has been unsuccessful for now 30 years. I think we, we actually have achieved a huge amount during that period. I'm not saying that everything which has happened during that period has been positive. But, for example, one of the things which has been completely passed over is the integration of the Central and Eastern European countries within the European Union, uh, which was a massive project, which was a very difficult one to deal with. Uh, there has been a lot of progress. Um, I, I think it is a very undifferentiated view of trying to put all the blames of this world on the European Union and trying to claim all the success uh, for the member state. I think this does not function. I didn't say everything the EU had done was wrong. I said it made some really critical bad decisions which have cost it dearly and have caused great problems in Europe. We're on Schengen, I mean, just to be clear, Patrick, so things would be better if there were now, you know, customs, borders. posts and borders in every European country and you stopped your car and got a check and went on? No, but, not necessarily, but you well, know, if you do Schengen, you've got to put something in its place. And this is what the Syrian conflict has shown up, that the borders to Europe are totally porous, you know? So, so they did Schengen, there was nothing put in its place, okay? So this is, this is typical European thinking. Uh, you know, they, they do stuff and then hope that something will turn up. I had a debate with a German politician about the euro um, at a conference in Königswinter, and uh, he, I said, that, you know, this is the time they were thinking of bringing the euro, and I said, look, you're going to have a lot of economic problems if you go to a single currency without the necessary accompaniments. And he said, good, because that means we'll be forced to build Europe. Now, that sort of thinking is really risky with a big body of nations, and that risk has come really badly unstuck. Yeah. 
But that's the point. Yeah, that's the those, point I'm making. No, and I think Schengen, again, no, but, a bold vision, no. but none of the nuts and bolts put in place. This is very typical of European thinking. Yeah. They don't put the nuts and bolts in place in a sort of Anglo-Saxon way that, you know, nuts and bolts are important to make policies work. Professor they have these Moisey, bold please. visions and just assume that everything will work out fine. Well, I think you have to go back to the origins of the euro and not forget that the euro was, above all, at the start, a political project. It was a vision of uh, Chancellor Kohl in particular saying, I'm the last chancellor that can make Europe and, uh, because I've known World War II. And he was in a dialogue with François Mitterrand, who had also experienced the war in a much more ambivalent way. And those two men, in particular Chancellor Kohl, played an immense role by saying, thanks to the euro, and I'm giving up the most important element of German identity, the Dutch mark, for the sake of Europe. He did it, and he did it, I think, by the end of the day, for the right reasons, with the right results. I think your remarks are, are just illustrate the irresponsibility of European policy. That Kohl and Mitterrand went ahead with a political project and played with fire economically. And it, of course, the fire economically is what destroys people's confidence in the project. And, you know, it's quite clear that you set Southern Europe on fire. And, you know, you didn't put it out. And all of this because Chancellor Kohl and Chancellor and Mr. Mitterrand, you know, President Mitterrand, had this kind of emotional view about using economics to create political union. We've been seeing a lot of disagreement, explosive disagreements between, uh, among member states and within the EU. Um, Dr. Gordon, so I first of all want to ask you, like, uh, what would, would you see about this fracturated model in, uh, of EU and Europe? It used to be a model of one sort of integration and democracy, mm -hmm. uh, quite a big experimental model uh, in the world. So with these kind of problems within um, what would you think about the global impact? Uh, it will have a global impact, and you're right about Europe being a model, mm -hmm. um, and not just for the region, but in a way for the world. I mean, it's a model of countries that for decades and centuries fought each other and saw each other's rival rivals and managed to come together in a way that respected their sovereignty because it was a nation states deciding these things, but was led to the longest period of stability and prosperity on the continent. And peace. And peace, and stability, peace, uh, you know, possibly forever. And was a pole of attraction for all of the neighbors in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, North Africa. And we would point to it when we would deal with other parts of the world, uh, including Asia, including the Middle East, as what can be done if countries decide that, that coming together in community uh, and solidarity is uh, more in their interests than competition and disintegration. And so in that sense, you know, again, not to be too, you know, overstated too much, but the British vote is not just a decision on, you know, relative financial contributions to the EU by Britain or relative tariff or non-tariff barriers. These are, you know, these are important things, but it's also a potential turning point in the world. Mm -hmm. Our country is going to say, and especially European countries, we still believe that our future is best assured mm -hmm. through solidarity, working together in cooperation, or have we just decided, you know, enough of that, we're going to go our own way? And from an American perspective, we worry that if the Brits do that, you know, others will follow suit. And that will be the new trend in European politics. Nationalism, and not just nationalism in terms of EU member states, but mm -hmm. within those states. And nationalism can be very, very uh, dangerous. And again, the last thing America needs from Europe is disintegration. When we're trying to deal with terrorism and climate change and refugees from the Middle East and Russia. Uh, we need a, a, a partner and, and actually a transatlantic community. And if the trend set off in part, I don't want to blame just British voters on June 23rd, but that's a big turning point in this. If that leads to a trend towards disintegration rather than solidarity, I think we all uh, around the world could suffer from it. Mm -hmm. Professor Moisey, what would you think are how we can sustain the solidarity and also the prosperity of Europe? Well, I, I feel very close to uh, what Philip just said. Uh, historians may look at the year 
2016 as a decisive turning point uh, without going to extreme sentences. Uh, it's not going to be the return of war. It's not going uh, to be the new Balkans. But it is going to be something much, much more significant than uh, uh, the simple wish to reassert a sense of sovereignty and power by people uh, who are not, in fact, aware of their responsibilities by doing so. The British vote goes, goes beyond Great Britain, uh, goes beyond Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why we are discussing it mm -hmm. with such passion and emotion right now. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I reply a little bit, since I'm in the dock here? It's uh, for your conclusion, <laughs> we, yes. We, we, we get breaths. Um, I, I don't see it like this. I think that um, what we're saying here is that this isn't the right uh, model for us. And we also, I, I also think it's not the right model for Europe. Uh, this, this constant move towards centralization. And I think, in fact, I don't think we're going to see the breakup of Europe, but I hope we will see a more sensible set of policies in Europe, which are less centralized, more responsive to democratic uh, pressures, uh, more um, sane economically, you know, uh, like this whole Euro crisis has been massively mismanaged um, because of the desire to cling on to the Euro structure at any cost. I think there's just lots and lots of things that Europe's got to reconsider. There's got to be more free markets, there's got to be abandonment of protectionism, there's got to be much more concern for unemployment, which is massively high in France, in, in Spain, in, in, in all over southern Europe, because of really bad economic policies, you know? There needs to be an injection of serious free market thinking into Europe, and maybe by leaving we'll bring you guys to your senses and you'll actually produce some sensible economic policies, and I hope you do. Uh, Zulik, uh, your conclusion for to sustain the, the power for Europe, how would you say? Well, I think the, the first thing to say is that I would still expect that on the 23rd of June, the British people will actually vote to stay in. Um, so in, in that sense, um, some of the, the debate we've had, we probably will not have. Um, uh, I think it is also true without any doubt that the European Union has made collectively uh, mistakes in the past, uh, which has involved all the member states uh, which are in the European Union. Uh, and certainly it's not an ideal model and we could uh, discuss a lot of things where we can say uh, the European Union should change. Uh, I think we would find that in many areas there are also disagreements about the direction. Um, the free market um, model is probably not something which is shared by everybody, uh, not even within the UK. Um, so I think that that is a, a debate we should have. But I think in the current situation, when I look at where we are, uh, globally, where we are with the kind of challenges which the EU faces, both internal challenges and external challenges, I cannot believe that fragmentation and isolation can be the right answer to that. I think that defies logic. I think in the end we need to deal with these challenges together. Uh, we should work on making what we have better, but in the end it is still the best institution we have and we should be working to improve it, not working to abandon it. Thank you very much. It's very, very intensive and interesting discussion. Um, thank you for your participation and I hope um, we will look for the, the outcome of the, the referendum and that we shall continue this uh, debate afterwards. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.